Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual event today. A ready target is single vendor reliance, a cybersecurity risk. My name is Matt Shears. I am president of the Computer and Communications Industry Association and moderator for today's discussion. Today, we'll be exploring vendor diversity in US government IT, and specifically the lack thereof, the extent to which this monoculture in government IT is uh, explored by the research that we're discussing today from Amdia. We'll hear about this report and then from a panel of experts who will discuss its implications and the potential ramifications for cost, for innovation, and security. So let me briefly introduce our guests uh, in alphabetical order. First, we have Drew Bagley, Vice President and Counsel of Privacy and Cyber Policy at CrowdStrike. Drew leads CrowdStrike's data protection initiatives, privacy strategy, and global policy engagement. And Drew has served in various governmental and intergovernmental advisory roles on cybersecurity and trust. Prior to joining CrowdStrike, Drew served in the Office of the General Counsel at the FBI. Next, we have Tim Banting, Senior Principal Analyst at Omdia. Tim is a Senior Principal Analyst in Workplace Services within Omdia's Enterprise Services team. And he focuses on unified communications and collaboration research. Tim joined Amdia in 2019, and he's got extensive experience in unified communications and collaborations, having held roles in pre-sales, technical, competitive marketing, business development, and senior product management. Before that, Tim was with Informer Tech, and prior to that, at Global Data, and he's also held positions as a senior product manager for Microsoft and the head of business development at Nextero One. We also have Karen Evans, Managing Director at the Cyber Readiness Institute. Uh, for over 20 years, Karen has been at the forefront of cybersecurity policy with congressional and presidential appointed positions in Department of Energy, Homeland Security, the Office of Management and Budget. Last but not least is Paul Rosenzweig, who is founder of Red Brand Law and Consulting. Paul is an accomplished writer and speaker with a national reputation in cybersecurity and homeland security. In addition to founding Red Branch, he's a senior advisor to the Chertoff Group. Paul was formerly Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy in the Department of Homeland Security and, among other appointments, is a professional lecturer at, at, in law at GW and a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He's also the author or co author of several books, including Cyber Warfare How Conflicts in Cyberspace are challenging America and changing the world. So we'll start our discussion today by hearing from Tim Banting about his findings. So Tim, why don't you take it away? Can you give us a quick summary of your research, how you put it together, the methodology, and, and what the top line findings were? Certainly, we'll do, Matt, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. So we ran a survey in October this year and went out to 250 respondents in the US federal, state, and local governments. And these respondents were either directly involved or had direct knowledge of the buying selection criteria for workspace productivity or communication and collaboration tools. Um, I guess the top level survey, the, the, the summary of the findings were um, that officials seem to be buying what's easiest for them and not necessarily what their end users want or need. Uh, we had about 57% of respondents stated that their top reason they chose a, a communications and collaboration partner was to reduce the work for their IT departments. And 44% said it was to streamline the procurement processes. And 39%, which was the last reason, was uh, on price. So we feel that officials seem to be buying what's um, easiest for them, pressing the easy button, essentially. The second area was um, around shadow IT. And what shadow IT is, is the unsanctioned use of of applications and services. So these tend to be applications and services that fly under the radar of IT. So that has serious implications because of course, that's not necessarily with the governance or security or the compliance that IT uh, departments work so hard to establish. Um, so this is also important from a user perspective because it means that they aren't necessarily getting what they need to be productive. So in that case, end users will simply buy, uh, buy or use what they need without IT say so, and uh, that can potentially 
um, present a security threat. And we found that in 33% of cases, uh, or sorry, rather, in 33% of respondents said that they made a unilateral buying decision based on the needs of their organization, that they make the final recommendation. So um, that final recommendation was also based on reliance and compliance. Um, and user demand was only about sixth down the list, and that was rated at 27%. So it feels as if people aren't listening to what their users need. And then finally, um, we looked at uh, security and um, security breaches and cost overruns and poor reliability. And those were the top reasons for decision makers questioning their technology partner relationship. However, 41% of respondents continue to buy from that single vendor. And the survey showed that 45% of respondents actually experienced a security breach and 47% cost overruns and 34% a solution failure. So despite all of these serious issues, um, they didn't uh, select an alternative vendor. So based on our survey, we, we feel, Matt, that um, there's an inertia around buying from a single vendor and that this sort of monoculture has normalized um, some of these issues. And that might not be in the case of end users and certainly not in the case of um, US government employees leveraging shadow IT and the unsanctioned use of applications to circumvent um, those, those um, security compliance processes that are in place by uh, IT departments. So what we feel is that better integration, more diversity, the use of other applications and services, and better choice for users would certainly offer better value for US taxpayers, and uh, also minimize that security threat and that security uh, attack vector. So shadow IT is not best practice in any organization, given the potential security issues, and certainly uh, not best practice for the US government. Thanks, Tim. That's very interesting. I appreciate that uh, survey, the findings, and, and particularly this, the phenomenon of, of shadow IT co-occurring with this uh, evolution of monoculture. So let me, uh, let me now turn and try and get uh, some, some thoughts and reactions from uh, our other panelists here today. Drew, let's start with you. Maybe you can give us some thoughts about the consequences of the government's reliance on a, a single vendor for so much of its email and collaboration and, and conferencing. What are the implications of that? And, and does it create risks? Sure, thank you, Matt. And thanks for having me here today. Um, you know, what we have today, we, we've talked about monoculture for about 20 years in the context of software. And we talked about it initially with operating systems, of course. But what we have today really is a verticalized monoculture where it's actually a lot more alarming and complex than what's been described in the past because you have situations where a government agency might use the same vendor, not only for what you're describing with email and collaboration tools, but also their entire IT stack, meaning that they are even paying the same vendor to protect themselves from vulnerabilities that could exist in that vendor's very products. And so that's where um, what that can open up are complexities with commonalities with the software stack itself. So if you look at authentication alone, and you look at some of the very significant cyber attacks we've seen this year, if you have a common flaw in an authentication measure used throughout the entire productivity suite and your security suite, and even your ecosystem with resellers, then that can pose a severe risk. And then on the, on the flip side, what you can have too going on is what Tim was just describing, where you could have users nonetheless seeking to use other software applications vis-a-vis -vis shadow IT. And what happens there is you basically have managed risks on the one hand with your single vendor, but those managed risks are only as good as what's being offered by that vendor. You don't have any sort of uh, third-party security software or anything there to help out. And then you have unmanaged risks from the shadow IT itself, where you could have all sorts of data flows going out of a government agency or just even software and access being introduced into the government agency and into that tech stack. And yet those platforms aren't necessarily managed by any sort of centralized system. And so that's where you really can run into a lot of trouble and introduce a lot of vulnerabilities that you wouldn't necessarily have 
if you were choosing between a diverse set of whatever was best to get the job done and not necessarily relying upon a single vendor because of maybe the ease of renewals, but uh, you know, actually going and, and shopping and looking for what's best in each category. Because you might have single vendors for a single type of application throughout government for, for uh, interoperability, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have this verticalized monoculture, which can lead to serious security risks. Thanks, Drew. That's interesting. Um, so, so, Karen, I want to turn to you and ask uh, about your thoughts on this, particularly from your perspective as a, a formal official, a former official. I'm sorry. How do we how do we get here? How does an organization get here? What kinds of behaviors or processes or, or habits can can lead to this kind of monoculture and IT procurement? And maybe you have any thoughts about what could be done to, to remedy that. Well, um, first off, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, and really reflecting upon what Tim said, I was listening to it as well as with Drew. And uh, this is like what's old is new again. These issues are longstanding issues dealing with, especially in the federal government from an enterprise perspective. I mean, a lot of the issues that you're talking about, about ease of use for the IT staff, and then the IT staff itself not really listening to their users is the whole reason why chief information officers, the evolution of that came around. But the whole idea of shadow IT is the whole reason why we had the Federal Information Security Modernization Act that got updated in 2012. You know, why we have different procurement statutes that make it illegal to have shadow IT staff that have not had their procurements approved going through um, the chief information officer. But I think at the heart of Tim's um, survey is the piece where the chief information officer has to listen to the component organizations or has to listen to the user needs. Because if you um, settle on a solution, um, and we're talking about now the, the severity of a monoculture, because it's your staff understands that technical piece under the total cost of ownership and can they believe they can secure it and they have the skill sets, then what is the gap for your component organizations and what mission applications do they need to have? And if you're not listening, that is the whole reason why a shadow IT shop comes about. I mean, we have other ways that the federal government works. Like you can buy, you can go out and buy things on a credit card now because the cost of things have come down so low that um, component organizations have authorities to buy things on uh, credit card and you don't know about it until they're compromised because of the way that we do um, inventory and assets management and things like that. And so um, Tim's survey is, is eye-opening because it's still the same issues, but they're now at an accelerated pace because of the environment that we're in. And I would also say that it is even more, it's a higher risk because we have changed the dynamics of the threat landscape when COVID hit. So a lot of enterprises thought, and I'm going to say thought because I know Drew will start laughing on this uh, since he works with CrowdStrike, thought that they could put a perimeter up. Anybody who tells me that they have a perimeter, I'm like, okay, we need to replace that person. Um, but that all changed and the whole threat landscape changed. So you know, from my perspective, that was a good thing because IT shops had to really think about how to integrate multiple solutions because you could not build out an office in each and every person's home. Thanks, Karen. That's interesting, particularly, you know, in private sector, we're always talking about the need to listen to the customer. But it's, it's interesting to hear that, you know, the government IT team has the same imperative to, to listen uh, absolutely to, to absolutely well. so let me let me turn now to paul and 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 make a correction since i said paul was uh with uh the heritage you formerly with heritage uh it, i obviously you've got enough uh, enough responsibilities already um but maybe you can tell us uh more about you know with your um you know past experiences you know why why you think these kinds of phenomena evolve um and and again you know is there anything that that policymakers could could draw from from the findings or or from your insights that uh, that would inform you know decision making to to remedy some of these issues. Well, 
I think the fundamental problem here is that ease of use is always uh, the enemy of security. Uh, and, and, and that's true in our, in our personal lives. It's why we all have password problems or not all of us on the panel, but, and none of the listeners, of course, because you're all brilliant, but the rest of the world has uh, password problems because it's so easy to remember one password and then iterate the number every, every time you have to change. Uh, simplicity and ease of use are always the enemy of security. Because security is, let's be honest, always at some level, a cost. Here, we're seeing that written at a grand scale. The ease of use problem here is the integration, the backward compatibility the, across a, an entire stack of, of applications of the sort that Drew was talking about. And honestly, I don't blame the IT department because... You know, they've got a million customers with a million different needs, each of whom is, is a challenge. And the last thing they want to think about is, you know, integrating a new collaboration workspace into a system that's already functioning pretty well, or a new communication system. Uh, that's hard. And so they take the, uh, the path of least resistance. And what that says to me is that at some fundamental level for policymakers, we need to take the decision about implementation out of the hands of the IT community. Not because they're stupid and not because we don't trust them, but simply because at the, at the work face in front of the coal mine, they don't see the broader security picture in the same way that we, we might. And so they don't make the decisions in the way that you and I might make them if we step back. Now, that doesn't mean that as a policy, we need to prohibit uh, monoculture integration in every instantiation. There are lots of implementation and enter uh, enterprise in implementations simplicity might very well be the cheapest and the most effective because the security profile, the threat profile, isn't that high. Uh, but there are lots of such implement, uh, implementations, lots of such enterprises where the security threat is high and where, as a matter of policy, we need to go outside of the simple procurement system and mandate a different approach. An example, our command and control systems in the defense industry, in the Department of Defense, high risk, high vulnerability, the failure mode for a catastrophic failure because of a single monoculture implementation is catastrophic, not just in the sense of, you know, the, the goods won't get there, but in the sense of America could lose a war. That's a context in which it seems to me policymakers ought to consider uh, mandating, for example, uh, dual use systems. You must have two of any collaboration system, must have two of any communication system, must have two of any cloud system available for use. Exactly where the line should be drawn between those high value systems where the security profile is so, uh, is so prominent that we want to mandate an inefficiency and those that are lower, that's hard to say. There will be gray in the middle, but I know for sure that there are some enterprises above that line and others below that line. And what Tim's survey tells me is that the people in the IT systems who are doing the day-to-day -day implementation don't know which side of that line they're on. And it's up to policymakers, risk analysts at a higher level to draw that line for them. It's, it's interesting, Paul, because you're, it's, it's another example of uh, you know, the decision-making, it sounds like you're saying happening in the wrong place, just like Tim's description of shadow IT means the decision-making is moving from the IT team to the end user. I think you're 
you're suggesting that that it, it needs to to move from from IT to the to the the risk management policymakers. So, so I, want, I wonder well, if I might be able to also um, add to Paul's Paul's comment there. Go ahead. Tim. Um, or also, if you, if you think of it from an end user perspective, um, they're not going. They, they are just trying to do their jobs and doing it in an easy way, a, a way that's easy and familiar to them. Uh, and the interesting thing here is as well, to, is, is another consideration, is employee um, adoption, if that's a barrier uh, as well, it means that the return on investment on which you made a buying decision will never get realized because no one will use those tools. You know, it's, it's almost like gym membership for me. I can, I can pay for a gym membership. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to go or get any benefit from it. I might go and decide to buy a pair of running shoes instead of someone buying me a gym membership. What I'm trying to say here is, it's all well and good IT providing these tools, but if they don't get used, um, it's not exactly providing better value. So no one's really criticizing the end users here for just choosing something that's easy for them to use because they're just trying to do their best work. So I have to jump in here, Matt, because I want to do a little bit of a clarification because I know Paul and I have been on several groups so, <laughs> together. So I know um, when he's saying certain things, there's a distinction here between where the decision making is actually happening. And so I think the results of what um, you know Tim is talking about here, depending on who actually responded to the survey, is that there's a difference between an IT operation shop who's doing certain things under the guidance of an overall framework and an end user who is trying to meet a need. And so when we talk about um, some of these things that are happening and the governance and the decision making that Paul is talking about, I want to make sure our audience doesn't get like all fired up here because the CIO in this particular um, uh, discussion is a policymaker who happens to have a technical background. So that um, I don't. Th so that's why when I was kind of going like this, I want to make sure that there's clarification in that there are CIOs. Like I feel like I've been fortunate in um, my career that I ran IT operations. So IT operations is one part of my group. Right. So it's like eat your own dog food and you can demonstrate that the policy is correct because all the people who I'm responsible for are adhering to the policy. And then the other part of that is if the framework and the policy is correct, then you can show where the deviations are to accommodate end user need and mission requirements. Right. And so um, there is a framework when you're asking for some solutions of how to get out of the ease of use and total cost of ownership and return on investment. And dare I say it is um, you really have to, the enterprise and, you know, a component can be DHS, the federal government can be an enterprise as a whole, and you're seeing this evolution yet again, is around architecture. And so you have to have the architecture in place. And this is not just the technical architecture, which would get you away from the monoculture. It is a multi-phased architecture that takes into consideration things like what are the business processes? What are the high value assets? How are we going to make our investments? What is our risk profile? What is our privacy profile? What is that tolerance in there? So that as that framework perpetuates through the organization decisions like um, you know, this dollar threshold has to go to the acquisition review board and that team has to present this phased approach to it. Um, DHS has a lot of those in place, right? So that you catch it when you're doing the budget planning out two, three years in advance and you catch it when it's doing the execution to make sure that it's in, in compliance with this governance structure. So I wanna make sure that we're differentiating between the actual results and how then are you going to um, be able to implement that through a large enterprise such as DHS or through the federal government and that the CIO and its shop really is a policymaker, not just the IT operations. Karen's exactly right. The CIO is, is, a, is a significant policymaker in all the federal enterprise uh, structures we have. Some of the decisions, you know, are, are so uh, uh, pregnant with risk that they may even rise above the CIO to the secretary of DHS, the secretary of defense. Um, 
I, I guess I can imagine hypotheticals where it's a type of risk profile decision that ultimately, you know, the NSC and the president would want to make. Uh, you know, it, it, the, it, it each is a, a graded one. And then there are obviously some others that, that can be made by the deputy CIO or, or further down. So you have to take it, um, you have to take each instantiation of enterprise risk profiling on its own and figure out the right level of, of differentiation. I'll, I mean, I'll give you one example from, from recent history that has struck me as one that uh, we got wrong initially and we now look like we're getting right. Uh, the Department of Defense was looking to do a giant cloud procurement. Uh, uh, they called it JEDI because it was a cute name. Uh, uh, that procurement has gone back to the beginning for a host of political reasons that are unrelated to our security discussion here. But one of the things that I thought was probably wrong in the initial procurement in any event was that the initial choice was to have a single source cloud provider, pick one winner. Uh, and that seems to me overly risky in the context of a Department of Defense uh, comprehensive cloud system. We might want a dual, dual, dual system. And it looks like that's where they're going with the new, new competition, which would be good. Uh, and that strikes me as the type of policy decision that really isn't you know, just at the CIO level, it's at, at the sec def level, uh, uh, chairman joint chief of staff level, maybe, uh, and maybe even the NSC level for what is our risk profile with respect to that kind of collaboration tool? And do we want one vendor with its ease of utility or two vendors or even three, I guess, but at least two vendors um, there. So that, that's a kind of example of a truly important, significant enterprise choice that maybe has uh, rises up even higher in the decision-making chain. That, that sounds like the, uh, this reminds me of what, what Drew was referring to previously about, um, you know, having, having some diversity in, in the procurement, but, but it'll, let, let, rather than, than put words in your, in your mouth, Drew, let, let me ask, you know, when you were speaking about this, I, you know, particularly with the hat on of a, a you know, private sector, it, were you in the role of advising, you know, these CIOs who are, or, or even more senior personnel who are making the kinds of policy decisions that, that Karen and Paul were describing? You know, what would you, what would you take away from, from the findings and your sort of general experience to, to, to better protect against the kinds of threats that we're talking about today? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, what both Karen and Paul described with just how to view risk that's exactly the right mindset where if you're in the private sector, you're viewing this the same way as you would in the public sector, where um, you know there certainly is concentra concentrated risk in certain areas and, and not as much in others, but you can have a policy where you have a technology first policy. Like you could have a cloud first policy and then you have to justify any deviation from using the cloud, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to continue with a single vendor uh, throughout everything. And, and what I was describing before is this is so different what we have now where it's a verticalized monoculture where you're talking about every single service potentially coming from the same vendor per what Tim's findings show. And so I think that, um, you know, in terms of how do you mitigate that risk, part of it is thinking about an analogy like, um, you know, if you were going to go on vacation, you could go on a cruise where your lodging is from the cruise uh, company, your food is everything is all your entertainment, but then if they all get sick um, or something happens, well, you're on that boat versus if you're booking your vacation separate through different vendors on land and, you know, your flight gets delayed, you could use another provider or your dinner, uh, you know, there's a fire at the restaurant you're going to eat at, you can go somewhere else for dinner, things like that. Um, you have a lot more flexibility. And I think that you need to think that way too, when you're approaching this in government, particularly where you have a high level of risk such as in many places in DOD or certain other national security focused parts of agencies that might not even be in the IC community themselves and then the IC community. But um, you know, fundamentally from a security standpoint, I think what agencies need to prioritize is really all of the technologies and strategies that were promoted 
and mandated in the May executive order on cybersecurity, because if you are focusing on achieving visibility, um, whether that's through EDR, log management, um, you know, then you're going to have visibility over these assets and that shadow IT problem if you're focusing on deploying technologies like that. And then if you're also actively threat hunting and looking for threats rather than sitting back and waiting to find out that, you know, an adversary has been in your network for two years, then that's the other thing. It's really, it's really about that. And then a centralized incident response plan, all of those things from the May executive order. I think if you combine that, with a thinking of, hey, where there is concentrated risk, how do I de-risk this? How do I diversify my approach to this? How do I ensure that if an adversary gets into one software solution, that doesn't give them a free pass to all my software solutions? I think that's really the mindset you have to have for this. Thanks, Drew. That's that's really interesting. But, um, I, so I want to I, I want to turn to both Karen and, and and then Paul and just ask, you know, to the extent that we're we're hearing about the the phenomena that that, that Tim is describing um, and uh, get a sense of whether or not this is something that you saw in your, your personal experience with government, you know, to what extent did you, uh, did you deal with this? You know, were there, were there vendors who are offering to help, you know, did the sort of, what was your experience with this particular phenomenon when you were in the government? Uh, and, and to the extent that you dealt with it, maybe you could give us some thoughts about what that was like. So the answer to all that is yes, throughout my 30 years in federal government, and to the extent that um, we try to deal with it, it depends on what level you're asking me where I was, right? So if I, when I was at the executive office of the president running the IT uh, for all of the federal government and making recommendations, there was a lot of things that we try to do at that point in partnership with private industry, because again, we don't own these assets, right? Like we'd like to think we had a lot on-prem and a bunch of different things, but um, we need private industry as partners to be able to uh, work on some of these solutions. So Drew mentioned, um, you know, for example, uh, after my tenure came up with a cloud first strategy. Well, it doesn't mean like pick one cloud first and everything becomes that one cloud. What it means is, hey, you need to think about getting rid of on-prem services because you don't have a, a set of, you know, staff and there's a workforce shortage. And so you need to leverage the capabilities of private industry. And that means you need to use cloud. So that that's what a cloud first strategy means. That's what the policy type of thing means. Like the other, um, a lot of what we did during my tenure was try to leverage the government uh, buying power. I mean, uh, when I left, it was at $71 billion. It was then got up to a hundred and some billion dollars. You can just look at the infrastructure bills now and there's like billions and billions of dollars, right? Okay, so that's very exciting if you're in the cybersecurity gov space as a private industry person. It's also very daunting from um, uh, a management perspective, like you want to realize the results for the American taxpayer when these dollars go out. And so you have to go back to Tim's result, uh, results of this survey and say, okay, what kind of mechanisms, what kind of policy, what kind of governance can we make sure that we're maximizing those investments. Um, we haven't talked, I mean, we started talking a little bit about some of the procurement, but the procurement officials will follow what the CIO recommends based on the requirements. And so uh, the technical team has to be really, really clear about the technical requirements, but it is a partnership. I'm gonna go back to the component organizations. They really have to talk a lot about what are the mission requirements and the mission requirements with the technical requirements have to go together hand in hand. And then when um, I think the other piece that we're talking about is we always had this requirement for redundancy and resiliency. I think now is the time that we have to really define again what redundancy and resiliency really means, right? So everybody's been talking about it, like Department of Defense having two different things. If I want redundancy and resiliency, there's a cost associated with that. The federal government gets its money appropriated by Congress. I have to articulate 
what is that tolerance? If the Department of Defense systems go down for 24 hours, somehow I'm thinking that that is not going to be tolerated from the president's perspective, right? Which means there's a cost now for me to have two cloud providers that uh, Paul was talking about in order. Now I have to make sure they're synced. How do I bring them up? You know, all of those things have to be taken into consideration, but that ability to perform, you have to be able to articulate it and the cost associated with it. And, and that drives everything. I've seen that everywhere, every job that I've ever had within the government, I have to be able to articulate that or shadow IT happens. It just, it happens. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, you no, know, it's a lot of what you're describing, Karen, sounds a bit like uh, you know, it's essentially it's insurance, right? And and you're trying to weigh against the the contingencies that you're you're insuring against. You're gonna pay a a, a premium for that. Um I want to take a question and uh, or, or pose a question to the, all the panelists, specifically um, with with regard to the cloud. Uh, there's you know a number of you have mentioned it, and uh, it seems that there's there's this uh, you know as as vulnerabilities are becoming more it seems frequent uh, and breaches more common. There's there's pressure to to patch quickly, and I, I you know I hear anecdotally that the IT teams feel like they're just they're patching all the time. And and there's a pressure to move things. That moving things to the cloud is is one way to alleviate that pressure and solve this problem by by allowing these kinds of things to be uh, automated. So so let me ask the, the the panelists. You know, is is that a solution? Is is a cloud-based solution where your vendor can do the patching for you more more quickly instead of having to to, to implement it locally? Does that solve some of these problems? Um, or or you know, curious as to your thoughts. So I don't know who wants to jump in first. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to jump in uh, first on that. Um, I think that's exactly right where it's a step in the right direction. It's it's not a panacea um, by any means, but basically uh, what you need to do is you need to shift the risk of patching and managing software systems to those who are responsible for those systems. And so to the, to the cloud providers themselves, that's a much better model. So the government agency can focus on its mission and getting its mission done for the American people. And if you are putting too much emphasis and responsibility on a diverse set of um, you know, vulnerabilities to patch that from week to week can be varying, then, then that's really something where your IT team might not be focused on what their original mission was to get the, the tools and support the tools for employees at that agency to do their job and instead be working to a, you know, an always patching mindset. And so I think that when you can um, really embrace more cloud technologies, like the private sector has done, then you're going to see similar results to what some of the most sophisticated organizations in the private sector have been able to do with their security posture, which is again, to really mitigate risk, have a more centralized approach where there is risk, and then therefore have actual managed risk instead of this notion of unmanaged risk and um, you know, you, you know, less flexibility in essence. And that's the other thing is if you have a bunch of on-premise solutions and you're up for renewal and they might not be working well and they may have had vulnerabilities, but you're faced with that onus of ripping them out and switching over um, to a whole new suite, well, there's a lot of friction there. And so that's another advantage of cloud is you really reduce that friction and so you can have that incentive to go with the best, stay with the most effective technologies. And if you had to switch, you could switch a lot more easily. Um, and so I think that's another advantage there. And that's another thing that really goes at Tim's findings with that monoculture. You're going to have you know, much more of a monoculture if you have a lot of friction. If you reduce that friction, then that's where you can really have choice and choose whatever's best. As, as Drew and uh, Karen were speaking there about on-prem, um, you just can't get the spares, you can't get the parts, you can't get the um, the experience on a lot of these on-prem solutions. In fact, a number of vendors have just sunsetted those on-prem um, solutions and there is but no alternative. You know, you have to go to the cloud. So um, it feels like the vendors have forced the hand on a number of, uh, you know, private and um, public sector organizations. Um, and quite frankly, the cloud is where all the innovations are. Um, you're getting features at a phenomenal speed 
some useful, some not so useful, but all of the innovation is in the cloud. Um, so it does feel a very attractive solution for a number of reasons. Um, but the days of the on-premise, on uh, you know, on-premises PDX and perhaps the email servers, those are those are really numbered. It's very difficult to have all of those wonderful, very secure, um, and, and pretty much physically secure based on, on, on the comms rooms that these things go in. Uh, environment so uh, it's it's a it's a real difficult situation to be in sometimes it sounds it's, like this is the sort of the rip the band-aid off problem right is that the transitioning away from the the physical on-premises equipment to a cloud solution is a, a big one-time upfront burden is that is that as well you, you have to be careful that you're not yeah. taking the scar off with the band-aid as well <laughs> yeah you, know, it's, it, you have i mean when when people go um, you you know and the other question is really to ask is it a lift and shift or is it really innovation taking advantage of the cloud innovations and so this gets back to the user requirements and looking at these platforms as a service right and so the internal IT team applications team CIO teams within federal agencies have to understand the applications and the dynamics of how these networks work um, if you lift and shift, which is probably the first iteration of what a lot of people did moving to the cloud, all you're doing is lifting and shifting the same vulnerabilities and putting them into the cloud. And then where is the line of demarcation between the cloud provider, the application developer and the CIO shop? So if you haven't written a good contract, a good tight contract, when a crisis happens, everybody is pointing the fingers at everyone else. And so that is not the time to find out that you don't have the right T's and C's in your contracts, right? And I'm sure Drew has had that opportunity in working in response with a lot of people um, through CrowdStrike. I think to the point that Tim is making is that's the opportunity of what applications are we shifting? What are the high priority? Which ones? Um, that have to scale. So we're back to resiliency, redundancy, and scalability, right? And then, and then it's also then you have the security and then um, and cost of ownership when you start really looking at that. And so big agencies such as FEMA, you want their like disaster response type of applications, grant systems, those types of things to move to the cloud because then they can do it on a per usage basis, right? You have it engineered in there, but they're not paying the way that government used to do this back in the day. I'm gonna have to say back in the day, that's how old I am now. Um, we used to have to build to worst case scenario because we couldn't scale. So what happens now is you can engineer these solutions by taking advantage of cloud and then also then have the scalability based on crisis and not paying for worst case scenario every time, but you've engineered the solution the right way going forward. Yeah, to, to Karen's point, there's a huge difference between cloud and cloud native, right? As Karen was saying, you can have a solution that's technically hosted in the cloud, but it's really the same fundamental design that had all the same vulnerabilities when it, when it was an on-premise version. And then there's cloud native where it's actually designed for the cloud, designed to scale, designed to leverage the cloud. And especially when you're talking about um, keeping up with vulnerabilities, whether you're talking about a productivity solution and what needs to go on on the back end from a security perspective, or you're talking about security software, that's where you're going to be able to keep up from an innovation perspective with adversaries who are constantly innovating. Whereas if it's just you know a cloud hosted solution of an on-prem uh, product, requiring the same sort of static updates and uh, whatnot, where it's not dynamic, then that's something that really isn't gonna be a huge advantage. Um, a good example and illustration of this actually came about when our CEO, George Kurtz testified before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence earlier this year. One of the things he was noting was that one of the mechanisms and the attack vectors used in the SolarWinds attack relied upon identity and a fundamental flaw that had been in the on-premise version of that identity architecture that had then just been ported to the cloud without any sort of fundamental re-architecture for the cloud. And that's a great example of something where you can have a vulnerability in a design itself exist for a very long time, up to decades, and then still be pertinent in the cloud today 
and have disastrous results, results, disastrous results at scale. And that's why it's really important to pay attention with cloud vendors to what they're selling. Are they selling something that's truly cloud native? If so, there can be many, many advantages. Um, but if it's just, you know, the same old software dressed up like a cloud, then that's not necessarily going to get you ahead. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, let me let me uh, briefly shift gears here um, and and say, you know, I think I want to tee up one of the questions that we often hear. <clears throat> excuse me, pushing back on on a, a you know diverse uh, and redundant systems, uh, which is is cost and complexity. You know, I, I think as, as as Tim was saying, uh, the the simplicity of the solution, pressing the easy button, is uh, you know I think very appealing to. The, the procurement folks do what you've done because it's it's what you've always done, uh, and and as, as as Karen I think was saying is that you, you sort of need to 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 justify the the cost of redundancy, right? So maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. You know, how do you respond to the the claims of just go go with what's uh, the go with the simplest solution here um, to to avoid these costs of complexity? We have a we have a real problem, which is that it's really easy to monetize and put a number on the costs of creating the redundancy with backup servers or dual systems, whatever it is you choose. We have almost no capability to truly uh, put a number on the costs of failure, whether it's the direct cost of failure to an enterprise, or more importantly, the externalities, the offloading costs uh, to other people. And that's true of private sector enterprises, but it's especially true of governmental and quasi-governmental enterprises, like an electric grid. Yeah, what is the offloaded cost of failure in the electric grid to the consumer? We don't, yeah, we we say, oh, it's billions of dollars, but how many billions and who and how it's allocated, we have no measurements of those at all. And so the biggest challenge, I think, in this entire debate is convincing senior policymakers that the uh, upfront costs of building in redundancy or resiliency to your system are actually worth it because the projected costs of failure without it are going to exceed the cost that you incur now. Uh, it's easy sometimes. I mean, you know, if you're you know, the Secretary of Defense and you tell him this will avoid 24 hours of downtime, he pretty much can you know, project that that cost is so extra astronomical that he won't incur it no matter what. And no cost of resiliency to avoid that is too great. But most other instantiations of enterprise failure are unrecognizable. Uh, to policymakers in terms that are actually persuasive. And that's kind of why we're in this, in this space, why we don't have, a, why we have the monoculture, because the costs of change are obvious. They're dollars to be spent next week. And the costs of not making the change are not obvious. So I, I have to jump in here because this is some of the work that I was doing in my last yes. go around within the federal government, especially um, as at the Department of Energy. But um, Paul has a lot in there. So there's a couple things that are underway, which um, Matt, you were bringing up through acquisition. So our current acquisitions process, especially in the federal government, makes us accept technically acceptable lease costs, right? So, so we're kind of a victim of a process that says, okay, if these solutions are technically acceptable and this, whoever has the less cost, that's the way you go. Um, and that's what the procurement people will go, unless the CIO can make the argument about uh, uh, best, best performance, right? Like you can do it based a performance-based contract and talk about performance, which then gets to the point of what ta uh, Paul's talking about, about being able to quantify some of the risk. And so I'm gonna give a shout out right now to Idaho National Labs. I'm gonna bring up something right here. Um, and Idaho National yes. Labs has been working on, and this was funded and we uh, at Department of Energy were really helping them with this deployment throughout 
all the critical uh, sectors, but especially the energy sector, is it's called consequent. It's called so uh, co cyber consequence engineering or consequence cyber engineering. And what it's really looking at is what is uh, the consequences associated with engineering a solution from a cyber threat attack vector. So think of it from it's a business analysis using MITRE attack trees, right? And national intelligence talking to the CEO of a company and saying, if these certain things happen, can you quantify that? You know, what is your risk tolerance? Like what, what would be the event? Like what would happen to the shareholders? Like in the grid, it's a little bit difficult because of the way it's being managed, right? And how it's regulated and how you have generation and transmission regulated, uh, but distribution is not. And that's where a lot of the new threat vectors are coming in because that's where renewables are. And we all want to integrate renewables. So you, you have to look at the whole ecosystem and INL has really been working on analyzing this and helping business entities quantify it because you have to go either to your regulators, you have to go to your community, you're gonna have to go to the people who are you know, doing things with the rates, you're gonna have to go to your investors and talk about, is this you know, just uh, uh, an operational expense or is this a capital expense? And then how are we gonna then incorporate this into the overall rate structure going forward? Um, I will tell you that DHS, so here's another shout out for another group, which is the National Risk Management Center, has also been looking at critical functions. So think of it as um, it's not just critical sectors anymore, it's critical functions. And how do you bring those functions together in a geographical area? So um, we were doing tri-sector work um, and they're continuing to do that. That tri-sector work is power, finance and telecommunications. So think about that. You, you have to have power. So you have to have some kind of alternate so, uh, solution. You have to be able to communicate and you have to be able to transact you know, financial things. That is no different than what happens at my house when a hurricane comes through and I lose power versus um, president of the United States. It's the scale that has to be dealt with. And then how do we then work as a collective? And this is why you're hearing the whole of nation approach, you know, especially with, uh, with the Biden administration going forward about, it's gonna take the collective, all of us, to be able to do this. So I'm gonna go back to Tim's survey is highlighting a lot of issues, even though it sounds like it's in the IT shop. It's actually showing all these different business processes that this is the opportunity for us to go back and reemphasize and how to fix them if we're focused on what is the right outcome, which is we want to raise the bar to the adversary. We want to get the noise out of the system, right? And we want businesses to flourish within the United States. So Karen, let me pick up on on one thing that you were mentioning there, uh, just and to make sure that I, as a as, as a, a non expert in the space, fully understand that that the uh, this the Idaho National Labs process that you were talking about was really it sounds like trying to to quantify these unquantifiable or unquantified variables of the the expected cost of failure to to allow uh, government enterprise to to better make. IT decisions that account for those and, and mitigate those risks because you can you well, can put a value yeah. on it. And, and it's not just IT systems, right? It, the CCE approach is really looking at risk. So think of it as another risk, but emanating from this threat vector of cyber because people have thought, whoa, cyber, I better have a computer science degree or something, or I got to hire CrowdStrike and CrowdStrike's probably all excited, right? Um, about that stuff. But really what you have to, like a business, so this is my new role as the managing director of CRI, a small business is not going to be able to do all this stuff. But it, what a small business can do is say, look, I want to make use of technology because I can reach a greater audience, right? And so 
what happens if my whole business is online and I lose my Comcast connection here during the day and I can't do anything that has a detrimental effect to my business, right? And so wh what am I supposed to do about those things? If I get attacked because of simple things that we're all gonna agree upon, like multi-factor authentication, we should all be using multi-factor authentication, right? Um, and then I become a victim of ransomware. I'm a small business sitting out here. I'm not a critical infrastructure provider, right? But I could be a small business who's critical in the supply chain for DOD that now I can't send the tires to them that they need because I'm victim of ransomware. And so that's really what we're talking about here. And that's what Paul's talking about. It's from the highest level of the president all the way down to the lowest person who is participating um, as a company or who could participate in what we're calling the national enterprise. So, so let, let's let's put like, I, I mean, Karen's absolutely right. This is hard stuff, and our, you know, aspects of our government are trying their best to wrap their minds around it. Uh, the National Risk Mitigation Center has has something called the Cyber Risk Systematic Cyber Risk Reduction Venture, which is an effort to first identify critical functions that happen, and then identify within those critical functions where risks are concentrated. You know, the, the electric grid is a critical function, but concentrated risk will happen at nodes within that, that grid. The financial sector is a critical function, but you know, there are nodes, uh, uh, I, I don't know enough about finance to identify them, trading nodes at the end, New York Stock Exchange or, or clearing houses, that sort of thing. And those places where the risk where the risk is concentrated, that's where we try and begin our mitigation efforts by focusing our, our risk reduction at the, at the place where the, the most bang for the buck. The problem really is that it's an insanely complicated system. Um, you know, there's a whole aspect of mathematics that is, that is complexity theory, which sadly basically tells you that in some ways, complex systems are un- comprehensible in a formal way. So we've got to do our best to approximate what we can do. And things like the INL's efforts or the NRMC at CISA at, at DHS trying to mitigate concentrated risk and develop a cyber risk model that you know, asks what the architecture is, what the risk metrics are, what the concentrations are, and, and what the mitigation steps are, and then cycle through that in any risk. That's the that's the, you know, uh, the best possible way we can address this. It's just hard, though. You know, we have nearly uh, exhausted our hour. And so I, I want to make sure that I, I give each of our, our panelists an opportunity to just uh, take 30 seconds and share any, any parting thoughts that you might have, or maybe better stated, if there's one takeaway that you'd have our audience take away from what you said today, what, what that might be. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll go through our, uh, our colleagues here in, in order. I don't know, Tim, if there's any sort of main takeaway that you'd like to, to offer the audience. Well, I think as a, re as a result of the last uh, 15 minutes, it's that hope is not a strategy. Um, and I think public sector have been caught out, you know, with, with COVID, we had this disaster recovery versus business continuity. The two are very, very different things. And you need to look at the cost of not doing something as much as you need to sort of uh, look at, uh, you know, I, I just don't think putting all your eggs in one basket is, is a great strategy. Uh, you know, diversify, um, really assess those risks, find out where the, the concentrated risk is, um, make sure you mitigate for them. Um, it's not an easy process, but it's, it's, it's needed. You, you can't just um, put all your eggs in one basket. We, we know what happens when you do that. Thanks, Tim. Drew, want to offer some thoughts? Sure, yeah. I really think the verticalized monoculture needs to be studied even more to better understand the ramifications here. But to echo Tim's point, I think it's really important from a security perspective that you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket and that you're not putting your security in the hands of the same people you're hoping to secure against or secure for. 
And I think that it's really fundamental when thinking about risk management to ask yourself, is your agency mitigating all risk or do you have a shadow IT problem? Do you have centralized visibility into all of your cybersecurity um, potential threats? Are you taking proactive measures like in the executive order? And I think if you ask yourself the right questions, you can come away with whether or not you have mitigated cybersecurity risks or unmitigated, unmitigated ones. And so I think that um, you know, thinking about a, a healthy software ecosystem in government is one step to hopefully getting you know better about mitigating risks and having fewer less fewer unmitigated risks. Thanks, Drew. Karen. Well, I appreciate uh, Tim's survey because it just heightens that even though we continue to think that we're doing a great job, we have to continue to do a better job. And um, I think he's, my colleagues are right. Um, I would just share this one thing, which is the circumstances, we're at another inflection point. And so I think there's a lot of positive momentum right now to get a lot of really good things done. And so if you just think about how you manage your own finances, you wouldn't just buy one stock. Everybody tells you to diversify, diversify, diversify. So I think if we take those life lessons and apply them into work, then we would still we would be in a really great place. Thanks, Paul. So uh, I guess I would end by saying that the discussion in the last 15, 20 minutes has has given the listeners a sense of the complexities of the problem. But I think for me, the takeaway is that the beauty of, of the survey that, that Omdia did, that Tim did, is that it, it simplifies the problem in a way that people who aren't in our space the same way that we are can understand it. This is the type of information that can and should be taken to perhaps the less cyber sophisticated policymakers in the world as a way of giving them the information they need to understand that putting all your eggs in one basket is a security risk. And so for me, the takeaway is that uh, happily, somebody like Tim has given us a, a data point that is comprehensible beyond our, our, our general sphere of expertise. And for that, I thank you, Tim, because it's a good, good report. Well, I think that's a, an excellent note for us to conclude on. This has been a, a very informative discussion. I wish we had more time to explore it, but uh, we are, time is limited. And so with that, I think I will uh, conclude today's event. And let me thank uh, our speakers, Tim, Drew, Karen, and Paul for sharing your expertise with our audience and bringing your insights about, about the findings today and, and hopefully offering some suggestions and paths forward as well uh, for our attendees. So, and let me also thank our audience for joining us today. We appreciate your uh, attention and hope that the event provided some insights for you to take away. With that, I think we can conclude. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.